nearly 40 years, brother, have been praying for my memory. You know, I appreciate that so much. <laughs> Almost everybody that prays, oh, something to have a ready recollection of his thoughts. Uh, and yet still this morning, I forgot and read the same scripture twice, but that's all right. You didn't know this, did you? Yeah, you know this. Yeah. That's better than not reading it at all, I guess. So I'd encourage you this morning to think of the churches that were addressed in Revelation, the seven churches, to think of them as people, just like us, because that's what they were. They were not perfect churches. If you think they were perfect churches, you need to go back and read chapter 2 and 3, where Jesus sent those personal messages to each congregation. You remember when he told the first church that was the one in Ephesus? You have forsaken your first love. You've forsaken your first love. Let's think about that this afternoon. You know, I doubt seriously that every member of the church in Ephesus had forsaken their first love and forgotten their love for Christ. That's what that means, to forsake your first love. I doubt that Tychicus or, or Timothy or, or any of the others that were there, I, I doubt that they'd all forsaken their first love. Maybe they had, but I doubt it. I think as individuals, some just forgot that Jesus is first. Just like we do, if we're honest, you know, through, we get going with our week and we just get caught up in things and sometimes we forget, oh yeah, I'm supposed to be loving Jesus. And if I love him, I'm going to do what he says. Jesus said, if you love me, you will do what? You'll keep my commandments. That's what we do. That's how we show Jesus that we love him. We're not perfect. We have our shortcomings. But if we love the Lord sincerely, God knows that He can tell. He knows when people are trying and, and when their heart's really not into it or not. And so as we talk about the victory of the Lamb tonight, victory for the Lamb. What I want to show you is that the Lamb is going to be victorious regardless of what we do. All we decide is if we're going to be on his side or not. But in the end, he's going to be victorious. So, that's what tonight's lesson is about. And that's really what chapter 16 and 17 of Revelation is about. If you join me there, Revelation chapter 16 is where it will be. Hopefully everybody got a copy of the outline. I made plenty of extras, I hope, this time. We're going to talk about victory for the Lamb, and, and we've built up to the point in the, the chapter, in the book of Revelation, where we're at chapter 16, where he's given all of the seven angels their bowls of wrath, and all the warnings have been dispersed, and it's time to pour out the wrath on the Roman Empire. So let's talk about that first, the seven bowls of wrath. Number one. Those who worship the Caesars as God felt the full wrath of the one true God. See, they bowed down to Caesar because Caesar was so powerful. And they said, yeah, you're God. And you know what God said? No, he's not. No, he's not. I am the one true God. In chapter 16, verse 1. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go and pour around on the earth the seven bowls of the wrath of God. So the first angel went and poured out his bowl on the earth, and it became a loathsome and malignant sore on the people who had the mark of the beast and who worshipped his image. The second angel poured out his bowl into the sea, and it became blood like that of a dead man. And every living thing in the sea died. And then the third angel poured out his bowl into the rivers and the springs of waters. And they became blood. And I heard the angel 
of the water, saying, Righteous are you who are and who were, O Holy One, because you judged these things. For they poured out the blood of the saints and the prophets, and you have given them blood to drink. They deserve it. It was so tempting to bow down and to worship the Caesars and talk about that this morning because it just made life so much easier if you did that. It just went with the flow, just went with society, and that's what the, the pressure was that our first century brethren were feeling. But God is warning them here, if you do, these plagues are meant for you as well. If you choose to change and to, to take the mark of the beast, and the mark is not a physical mark, it is having your, your thinking and your actions marked because you follow Satan. And if you worship his image. And so this, this pouring out of these bowls of wrath, and this is very quick. You know, in one chapter, all of the bowls, all the seven bowls are going to be poured out. The first one, when he poured out his bowl, there's malignant sword reminiscent of Exodus chapter 9 where the, the plague of the boils, you remember that? It was one of the ten plagues. And just like in Exodus 9, the plague of boils was only on the Egyptians. It didn't affect the, the sons of Israel. So this is the same way. This is only on those with the mark of the beast. They receive this, this plague. The dumping out of uh, the bull on the sea and it turning to blood, well, that's reminiscent of also one of the plagues in Exodus chapter 7, verse 19, where even the, the water that was in the jars and the buckets turned to blood. And the rivers of the springs as well, Exodus 7, verses 14 through 20, talk about the Nile River that received this plague be turned into blood. All this is, is not literal, but it's saying that it's coming. This wrath is coming. The wrath of God is being poured out. And there's going to be a reckoning for those who oppose God. And when he says in verse 7, I heard from the ones who was over the altar. I heard the altar saying, yes, Lord. This is right. This is true. This is just. God, you are just in what you're doing. Because they have poured out the blood of the saints. And they have killed the prophets. And so this is righteous. And the, the altar that's being mentioned here in verse 7 is a reference back to chapter 6 and verse 9. Where underneath the altar are the souls of those who've been slain. And in verse Ten, they're crying out, How long, O Lord, holy and true? And will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood? That's the altar that is crying out. This is right. This is just for God to do this. Number two, God's judgment was righteous because Rome was terrorizing the people of God. That's why this was right. That's why it was very I'm sure that those in Rome said, this is unfair, this is too harsh. No, it's fair, it's right. Because they were persecuting the people of God and something had to be done. It would be unjust, it would be unrighteous for God to do nothing. To not step in and to help his people. Number three, the people blaspheme the very one who can rescue them from suffering. Now, think about that one. The one God who can rescue them, and rather than beg God for forgiveness and repent, they are blaspheming him. In verse 8 it starts, The fourth angel poured out his bowl upon the sun, and it was given to scorch the men with fire. Men were scorched with fierce heat, and they blasphemed the name of God, who had the power over these plagues. And they did not repent, so as to give him glory. Then the fifth angel poured out his bowl, on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom became darkened, and they gnawed their tongues because of pain. And they blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and they did not repent of their deeds. 
This is a description of apocalyptically the Roman Empire being plunged into darkness, which is obviously an analogy to the plague of darkness in Exodus chapter 10, verses 21 through 29. Not literal. These are things that are showing that God is coming in judgment. He's going to avenge his people. He's going to make the things that are wrong. He's going to make them right in their lifetime. And all they needed, number four, what they needed to escape God's wrath was repentance. Repentance is when you are remorseful about your sins to the point that you make a change in your life. You say, I'm not going to do this anymore. That's repentance. Change of heart that results in a change in behavior. Let's talk next about Armageddon. Armageddon is not something that's off in the future. It's something that has already happened. There's no evidence in the book of Revelation that the things that are taking place here are way, way off in the future. It would be taking place during their lifetime. He says in the opening three verses, the time is near. It is at hand. It's close by. He says at the end of the book, these things will soon take place. The time is near. Don't seal the book, John, because the time is near. And so Armageddon is not something that we are waiting to happen. It has already happened. It's been fulfilled. But it still has an application for us today. Because application, the application is when the original Armageddon was when the armies or the, the Roman Empire, the kings gathered to battle against God. And we have a battle as well that we're fighting. And we have to think about which side we're on. Point number one, if you're fighting for the world, you're fighting against God. And that's what 12 through 16 is saying. It says the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river, the Euphrates, and its water was dried up so that the way would be prepared for the kings from the east. And by the way, the very first world power or power that, that fought against Rome that was really a threat was the party of Scythians who came from east of the Euphrates. Verse 13, And I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet, three unclean spirits like frogs. And they are the spirits of demons, performing signs which go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them together for the war of the great day of God the Almighty. Behold, I'm coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake and keeps his clothes so that he will not walk about naked and men will not see his shame. And they gather them together to the place which in Hebrew is called Armageddon. Armageddon. Well, we hear a lot about that. This is the only verse in the entire Bible that mentions Armageddon. And people try to take it literally. Of course, if you're going to take it literally, what is it? It's, it's three frogs who went across and dried up the Euphrates River. That's all it is, if you want to take it literally. But no, it's so much more than that. Armageddon is not mentioned elsewhere in the Bible, but Megiddo is. Point number two, Armageddon is the place where those who fight for God never lose. And I really struggled with this point and how I was going to word it. I, I think I've worded it as close as I can, but the way I have it worded, it kind of gives you the impression that those who even say, hey, I'm on God's team, and they fight there, they're never going to lose. And that's not what that means at all. Because if you've read the Old Testament, you know sometimes it's difficult figuring out who's really fighting for God. God worked through the Egyptians one time to win a war in his favor. He worked through the Babylonians to win a war in his favor. He often used pagans to accomplish his will. So just because... Armageddon means those who are victorious in the name of God doesn't mean necessarily that it was the people of God. I'm not explaining this well. Let me just show you the scriptures. That's the easiest way to do this. Armageddon, the Mount of Megiddo. In Judges chapter 5, verse 19, we have, that actually is the song of Deborah, where God's people were victorious, and it took place at Megiddo. 
That's Armageddon, Mount of Megiddo. It says the waters of Megiddo here, but that was referring to a, a wadi that was on the backside of the mountain of Megiddo that drained from a basin. And so it is referring to the same place, the Mount of Megiddo. Uh, this next scripture in 2 Kings chapter 9, verse 27, talks about Ahaziah, who was a very wicked king, who actually was uh, caught up in the sins of Ahab, who was one of his predecessors and, and was evil. And so Jehu had him killed and Joram as well in that text. So here's another instance where God's people were victorious. But the next one here in 2 Kings chapter 23 is where Josiah dies. Josiah was a good king, and he was killed by Pharaoh, Pharaoh Nico. And so there's an instance where you think, well, wait a minute, Josiah is the good guy, and he lost. Well, still, if you go back and read the context, God worked through that event to accomplish some good. And then this last scripture in Zechariah is actually just a reference back to 2 Kings 23, talking about the mourning that took place when they lost Josiah. So what Armageddon is, is the place where, it's true, this is where those who are fighting for God never lose. You just have to figure out who's fighting for God. And we as individuals, of course, we have to figure out which side we're on. If you're fighting against God, then you are going to lose. And if you're fighting for the world, you're fighting against God. As I said there in point number one, it's James chapter 4, verse 4 says, You adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity or hatred toward God? So we want to make sure we know where we're on, which side we're on. Armageddon is that place where God never loses his battle. Point number three. Those in defiance to God are condemned. They just may not know it yet. Look at verse 17. Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl upon the air. Notice how quickly we're already to the seventh angel. All seven bowls are being poured out. He poured it out upon the air, and a loud voice came from the temple of the throne, saying, It is done. There were flashes of lightning, sounds of peals of thunder. There was a great earthquake, such as there had not been since man came to be upon the earth. So great an earthquake was it, and so mighty. The great city was split into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. Babylon the great was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of his fierce wrath. And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. And huge hailstones, about a hundred pounds each, came down from heaven upon men. And then blaspheme God because of the plague of the hail, because its plague was extremely severe. When God institutes his judgment, people are condemned, and like I say here, they just may not realize that they're condemned yet. It's just like today, you know, most of the people I've, I've gone to visit Christians who have fallen away from the it's not one of the more pleasant things that, that I do as a minister. But you know, rarely, very rarely, when you go talk to somebody who's fallen away from the Lord, do they acknowledge that they've fallen away from the Lord. Almost every time, it's a no. I'm still good with the Lord. This isn't my fault. It's always somebody else's fault. Somebody did this or they did that. Every once in a while, I've come across somebody and yeah, I don't know. I'm outside of Christ. Nothing you can do about it. I'm not coming back. Sometimes you encounter those. But more times than not, you encounter somebody who has fallen away and they don't even realize that they have fallen away. There were people in the first century who were living in opposition to God who would have never said, yes, I'm living in opposition to God. But they were. Number three. Those who defines a God are condemned. They just may not know it yet. Let's go on to number four. Rome eventually divided into three warring districts. Now, let me walk you through this historically. The first century, when this prophecy was made, is where Rome is, is dealt to knock out punts. This is where 
As the angel says here, it is done, verse 17. It's done. And from that moment, Rome was declining through the reign of Vespasian and through his son Titus, but especially his second son Domitian. Domitian was quite a bit younger than Titus. He really wasn't trained and prepared to lead the empire. His brother was. Titus was well prepared. He had, he had military background. Domitian did not. Domitian just came to rule because Titus died at a young age. Everybody hated Domitian. He was not only hard on the Christians, he was hard on the Roman people. He had many people killed because he was suspicious of them. He was immoral. He was a evil, wicked man. And he was killed by his own people, by his own Roman constituents in 96 AD. All through the second century, Rome continued to decline and by the third century, it was divided into three sections. Let me show you a map here. Uh, the green section up there in the top was uh, France and Britain. That split into uh, the Gallic Empire. And then the middle section that stayed together was Spain, Italy, Croatia, Asia. Uh, all that was part of the what remained and was called for a long time the Roman Empire, as we know, it continued to divide. And then the, the yellow part was the uh, Palamarines under the reign of Queen Zenobia. And so that was Egypt and Palestine and up into Syria. So we divided into three parts. And you see the prophecy here that in verse 19, the great city was split into three parts. Babylon, Babylon, of course, is an apocalyptic name for Rome. So Rome eventually divides into these three parts. And Armageddon is fulfilled. It's all, all that prophecy is fulfilled. As I said earlier, it still has application for us today. Let's talk about one more section here. The harlot or the lamb. Talk first about the harlot. Number one, worshiping something or someone besides God is actually spiritual adultery. I'll explain what that means here. To reread verses 1 through 7 of chapter 17. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and spoke with me, saying, Come here, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth committed acts of immorality. And those who dwell on the earth were made drunk with the wine of her immorality. The word there for immorality is pornea, means sexual immorality. And he carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness. And I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast full of blasphemous names, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was clothed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having, her hand, having in her hand a gold cup full of abominations and of unclean things of her immorality. And on her forehead, a name was written, a mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, and of the abomination of the earth. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints, and with the blood of the witnesses of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered greatly. And the angel said to me, Why do you wonder? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her which has seven heads and ten horns. Adultery. We know what physical adultery is. That is a husband or wife who is unfaithful, who goes out and prostitutes themselves or, or commits sexual morality with somebody that they are not married to. Spiritual adultery is the same thing, but it's when we're supposed to be loyal to the one true God but we go out and we worship another god. And in those days, it was the Romans. It was the Roman gods. They had Bacchus. They had Dionysius. They had Diana. They had Zeus. And they also worshiped the emperors as gods. In our day and age, it's different things. It's sports. It's jobs. It's being popular. It's fame. It could be self. A lot of things that we worship 
as God. Anything that you exalt above God, that's what you're worshiping. Anything you place higher in your life than God, that is spiritual adultery. And that's what they were committing. And that's why this woman is referred to as a harlot. She prostituted herself. And the name in verse 5 that's on her is Babylon. I've already explained that Babylon is an apocalyptic name for Rome. And so this is Rome. And she is committing adultery. And number two, notice that adulterers may live in comfort for a while, but their judgment is coming. It describes her, and she's in purple, and she's adorned with precious gold, and she's, uh, she looks like things are just going good. And, and that's why it says that when John looked at this, he wondered at what was happening. He, I wondered greatly, he says at the end of verse 6. And the angel asked him, what are you wondering about this? Well, he's wondering because I thought, I thought Rome was supposed to be suffering. I thought they were supposed to go down. And the angel essentially tells him, they are. Rome is going down. The judgment is here. The mystery of the woman and of the beast that carried her, which has the seven heads and the ten horns, that this woman is born separate. I'm going to skip this section here, verses 8 through verse 13, because I just preached on it a couple of weeks ago. Let's go on, number 3 here, to verse 14. The Lamb is victorious regardless of how many oppose him. Verse 14 says, These will wage war against the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them, because he is Lord of lords, a King of kings. And those who are with them are the called and chosen and faithful. And he said to me, the waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. And the ten horns which you saw are on the beast. These will hate the harlot and will make her desolate and naked and will eat her flesh and will burn her up with fire. For God has put into the hearts to execute his purpose by having a common purpose and by giving their kingdom to the beast until the words of God will be fulfilled. The woman you saw is the great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. If there was any doubt who the heart of it is, now you know for sure. The great city that rules over the kings of the earth could be none other than the Roman Empire in this time. Notice the victory of the Lamb, though. They're going to wage war against the Lamb, and the Lamb's going to overcome. It makes it that almost matter of fact. It's just like, obviously, the Lamb is going to win. Who is the most dominant? The Lamb is going to win, and so whether you win personally, as an individual or not, just depends on whether you're with the Lamb or whether you're with the beast. If you surrender and give in to, to Satan, and let him have control of your life, then you are going to lose. You're not going to be victorious. But the Lamb is always victorious. He cannot lose. Point number four. God may not deal with injustice on your time schedule, but he always makes things right. The God that we serve, he is able to make things right all the time. We sang the first song, or the second song actually, that the chase led has these words in it. Never let me wander from it. The never leave the God I love. I hope it's your, your prayer that you never want to leave God. That you never want to be found unfaithful to Him. We're not perfect, as I said from the beginning. We stumble in many ways. And that's why we have each other. And that's why we have the invitation. The invitation is an opportunity for us, as believers, to seek out the prayers of one another. To be able to say, I, I've just not been the person that I need to be. I've not been the woman. I've not been the man that God has called me to be. And I want to make some changes. If that's where you're at tonight, and you want to have the prayers of the church, please come. Because we stand in the same <laughs>